thank you very much. I'm uh, no specialist in uh, general education. Um, I will not be talking about all the uh, technicalities and mechanisms of transfer and articulation. Um, I have been asked to do something on education in general, uh, whether it's a sub-degree or it's a four-year degree. So my subject is on general education and liberal arts. I think liberal arts education is different. We have to make a difference between general education and liberal arts. To me, general, general education focuses more on curriculum, while liberal arts education or liberal arts focuses much more on the teaching and learning processes. So one is more focusing on contents and the other one is more on uh, processes. But certainly they are complementary and they are what I call the pillars of undergraduate education. Now, uh, I start with the purpose of education. Why GE and LAE, that's a little arts education, so important to me as an educator for over 50 years. Um, I believe there are two ultimate objectives of education, two ultimate objectives. One is really to make or to turn students, you know, to have a successful career. A lot of teachers, educationists, would stop there. Our job, you know, is to see students have a successful career. But I think that's not enough. In my view, it's even more important, or equally important, for students to have a significant life. So that is our job. They have a successful career, but at the same time, a significant life. It's very easy to define successful career with money, power, status, physical pleasure. That's very easy to define. But much more difficult to define what a significant life is. Now, in a simple way, be a happy life, meaningful life, and worthwhile life, but still a little bit of more elaboration and definition of what you mean by a significant life. But I believe that's our job as educationists. We teach. We want to see students to lead a successful career and a, and a significant life. Now, to me, the two pillars, the two things, which would help students achieve these two goals would be general education. It's not so much about majors. Uh, by the way, we don't call them majors. In our community college, we call it specialism. Right? That's a better word. <laughs> All right, in medical school, they call them specialty, but we call them specialism. <laughs> now, whether you are in a community college or in a university with four years, you have to have a general education curriculum design and a liberal arts education approach to teaching learning. So one is process, the other one is curriculum. Now these two, I think, are, are crucial for our job in teaching undergraduates. Now, um, what do you mean by, but first of all, we want students to have a successful career. Now, how can a student be able to succeed in one's career in this modern world, in this what we call the world of the new economy, the creative economy, the ICT economy, or the fourth industrial revolution. Whatever you call it, how could students be successful? Now these are my summaries. To be successful in career, not necessarily in life. But in career, today's ICT world, the first thing is characterized by computer, computerization, everything is computerized. Everything is digi digitized. And we talk about big data. The other day I was visiting Tencent, Tencent in Shenzhen. They said they have 900 million data in hand. Right? Because so many subscribers. So that's big data, 900 million uh, data in hand. So they can do anything they like, a big analytics, anything. So big data, this would be, so today, it's not only economies of scale, what I learned, and not only economies of scope, but it's both scope and scale. You have to produce in large quantity, and you have to also produce in a wide variety you know, of fields and subjects. 
So at one time, it's only scale. The world was dominated by scale. Uh, what I learned in 1907, when Ford first produced the T model, it was the classical model of economies of scale. Produced large quantity of model T, and then sold it at a very low price than the competitors because of the produced in large quantity, mass production. So if you produce more, the average cost will be even less and you will be even more competitive and you, you will even have a bigger market than you drive out all the competitors. Now that's the model for 100 years, what we call the Ford model. Then with the, all these new things coming on, we have the, uh, what we call the General Electric model. General Electric was maybe a household appliances, some uh, environmental technology, but, but in the 90s, with Jack Welch, General Electric becomes really a great diversity you know, of activities, from technology, environment, medical, uh, uh, GE capital, etc., in finance. So then it's scope. So today's world, a student has to face economies of scope, and economies of scale. And today, it's not only scale scope, but I call it Alibaba and Tencent stage. It's both scope, you know, and scale. Meaning for education. The resulting students from us have to be multi-scale because today you are doing one thing, tomorrow you will be asked to do a different thing. So one has to be multi-scale, not just one specialism or one major. It's transdisciplinary. I don't even talk about multidisciplinary, it's not good enough. Uh, I don't even inter, I use the word trans. It's intermingling of different disciplines. And then insights, today, no information. When I was a student, I was told information is power. Today is nonsense. <laughs> information is not power. When you start a search engine, the students know more about you, <laughs> about you, you know, on the subject. So today is nothing about information. It's so easy to have access to. Then what is the difference? How are you distinguished a smarter people from a less smart one? It's after having access to the same information, one gets something more. Can get something like a newer, a different idea. That's what we call insights. So today is not information, not even knowledge. So I don't talk about information-based economy. I don't talk about knowledge-based economy. It's insight-based economy. If you don't have insights, you are finished. Right? No matter how much you know. Now that's the whole world has changed in terms of our teaching objectives, our teaching targets. Number two, disruptive technology. We all heard about this term. It's disruptive and also it's pervasive. Once you have a technological change, it changes everything. Because if you have one ICT innovation, the application is endless. It's not only one, but it's pervasive and continuous every second. So for those who know Chinese, I was told that you know, every minute, every day changes. But today's new sun CC. Every second is changing. Right? E even the idiomatic expressions change. You know, today. So every second you face changes today. Now then the implication again for education is coping with change and grasping lifelong education. Every day you have to learn, there's no end to teaching. So <coughs> nothing can be truer than today when you refer to lifelong learning because things are changing continuously and pervasively. Now, globalization, again, is a, today virtual or physical. You almost can reach every part of the world easily. Now, not only information, but goods, services, capital, information, human, natural resources, everything is mobile. Now, even economic theory has to be modified. Again, I'm, I'm a student of economics, so I was taught about Ricardo, classical economics, about comparative advantage, right? about England and Portugal, you know, this classic you know, diagram, and I was shown, you know, food and cloth. Today is no longer true, because it's so mobile in resources, what do you mean talk about comparative advantage? It's based on what you have and you don't have. Today, resources are so mild, are so mobile, you can have everything, everything you like. You don't have land, you invest outside, you buy up the land in Australia, New Zealand. 
There's no question of scarcity. From your point of view, there's no natural constraint. And no natural resources constraint to yourself. So today, we don't talk about natural competitive advantage. We have to talk about acquired or creating comparative advantage. You can create it yourself. If you cannot create your own comparative advantage, you are not so good. Now, so these are the new economy. How to become successful. I think that would change our objectives of education. How to lead students to have a successful career. Now, implications of education number one, one, facing this brief new world. Right, it's such a different world. Uh, a, few, a, a few key words we have to bear in mind when we teach. First is specialists are not really important. Of course, you still need specialists. But compare, you know, relatively, we need even more whole persons or renaissance, uh, one, uh, renaissance person, the middle-aged people, like Da Vinci, like Michelangelo, uh, who know science and arts. So today you need a whole person, not specialist, because things are changing so quickly. Right? The world you know, needs creativity. So the word keyword is no longer specialist, but whole persons. Whatever way you define, I only define it. I won't mean by whole persons. What do you mean by a renaissance you know, person? So we have to go back to history. So we don't talk about training and even teaching. Outdated word, I don't like the word training. Training is, you know, is not good enough. Training is only for one skill. One skill is for one time. Uh, it won't last long. What I talk about is the word nurturing. The key word is nurturing. You can't finish in one day. A training can be in one day, but nurturing takes years. Another word is, it's not imparting knowledge as teachers. We were, all, we were always told, you are a teacher, you are imparting knowledge. Not quite true today. You really develop insights and wisdom right, of students, rather than just give them, you know, feeding them knowledge. Then another key word is, not the level of education that matters, but the type of education a student or young people receives. So much often, I, uh, if I'm very unhappy with my HR person, because whenever I do recruitment, uh, he or she, the HR manager, will give me all the qualifications of the candidate. So all, because to save paper, my colleague always gave me only the highest qualification. So candidate A, PhD somewhere or some, someone, a few PhDs. But I think what I need to know is not the level of education, not even the highest level of educational attainment. What I want is to know the whole process of education that the candidate has gone through. Going back to primary school, whether the primary school is teaching the right things is even more important, whether he or she has a PhD. So, but my HR managers never, you know, listen to me. It's always just give me the highest qualification. <laughs> so at one time I got mad. You know, so many times I think I was angry with my colleague. It was after five times. You know, she still gave me the highest <laughs> qualification of the applicant. So it's the type of education. I want really to know what kind of education right, the candidate has gone through, not the highest. So, and then another key word is, I'm sorry, we are we in higher education, but today. Maybe basic education is more and more important because you talk all about this nurturing, you have to start from young. Right? So basic education must be of equal or even greater importance. Right, next. Uh, I said whole person is so important for today's world to have a successful career. I try to characterize a whole person, and define a whole person. Um, I use a, B, C, and three C's. Now, these are the keywords that a whole person would have to possess. Today, we don't talk about knowledge, we don't talk about information, but you must possess A, B, C, something which cannot be taught but can only be nurtured. That will be adaptability. A, B is a brain power, and third, creativity. And you still need some skills. The skills would be rather generic skills like cognitive skills, communication skills, and community skills. Community skills will be interpersonal skills. So you need certain skills, generic skills, plus 
some attributes of adaptability, brain power, and creativity. All this, either you're born with it or with them, or you have to be nurtured. You cannot be taught overnight, you know, for all this as a whole person. Now then, the next question is, we really want to create some whole persons. What would be the best way? I'm sorry, I have to do my own promotion. Level arts education. <laughs> so, what would be the, the more likelihood, a higher likelihood, to produce whole persons? Everybody can produce whole persons. Every education system can produce whole persons. My, my, in my view, it's more likely. Right? The likelihood is much higher for the liberal arts education approach you know, to undergraduate education. Not necessarily, of course, graduate schools. Now, then liberal arts education is defined not by context. That is the greatest, maybe, misperception of most students' parents. You come to a liberal arts college, you know, not because they teach different subjects, but because they adopt a distinctive teaching and learning in the process. They teach and learn differently. Now, then is the focusing on generic skills, uh, nurturing rather than training, developing insights more than imparting knowledge. Now, that is the job of liberal arts education's distinctive teaching and learning processes. So I think they fit into the modern world of the fourth industrial revolution. Now, liberal arts education, of course, you should all know, I'm sorry to repeat here, but there's so many misconceptions. I had to do this every time when I do a kind of an information day, you know, in high school, you know, to clarify what liberal arts colleges or what liberal arts education is. Now, liberal arts, the first mistake is not arts. Right? And a lot of my students in Hong Kong, they say liberal art, art, art as if it's art. Now, usually they commit two mistakes. They say liberal art education, or they say liberal education. No, I say please say it correctly. It's liberal arts education. Now, liberal arts education is not arts, but arts and sciences. You know, a lot, you know in all liberal arts uh, education curriculum, science, of course, is also fundamental. It's arts and science. Now, it was originally coming from the Middle Ages. You look at is the, tri the trivium and the quadrivium. They are all science and arts in the medieval universities. So that was the origin of the vast education, science and arts uh, during the Middle Ages. Now, liberal arts is defined by the distinctive process, not by subjects. And the characteristics, if you want to have the distinctive teaching and learning process, which you are going to see in a moment, next slide, you have to have three prerequisites. Now, you may argue everybody can take out that kind of teaching and learning process, but you cannot unless you have the prerequisites. So I'm trying to develop the theory in a sense, step by step. Right? You have to have the prerequisites. I'm sure, I'm sorry to say, poly you cannot do it. Because poly you does not have the prerequisites, no matter how good you are. <laughs> all right, the prerequisites are small, all right? 1,000 to 1,500. Uh, 1, Your president will never want that. Why right, so small? <laughs> so these are prerequisites before you can practice. You know, liberal arts education. So number two is residential. At least 80%, again, most universities could not do it, except in Lam. In Hong Kong, they have 110%, you know, <laughs> resident spaces. <laughs> now, then the third, it must be student-oriented. This is not easy. Easy to say, difficult to practice. The test, the ultimate test, is a million, a billion dollars coming down from heaven. What are you going to do? Ask your presidential group, your SMT, your senior management group, right? If you have one billion falling from heaven. Right? For a research intensive university, of course, what equipment we need, what research project, we need the money. But for little us, what can we have the students? Right? Should we build better dormitories? Right? Should we reduce the uh, student staff ratio? So the thinking, the mentality will be different. Right? The mentality is totally different, and you can go through a test. So not all universities will be able to have, you have a very commitment, president. Right, followed by all the senior management team. Right? You are student-centered. Now next, also to make it easy to remember, the distinctive teaching learning process are five, the prerequisites. Right? Only if you have the prerequisites, 
then you can follow all this thoroughly. The first I is interaction, always interaction. Every time it's talking about you know, student staff, president staff, uh, some of you know I had pre breakfast with every single student when I was a president of a college. So I ate breakfast. Uh, lucky I, I still you know, remain brothers, you know, not fat. So every morning I had, I had breakfast with 10 to 12 students. That interaction, you have to set a role model for your faculty members right, to be very close to the students. We pay every staff member $1,000 to have coffee and pizza right, with students. Right? If they have a cup of coffee with students, they can claim reimbursement. <laughs> so individualization is another important concept. Because when I teach in a liberal arts college, you don't treat a class. You always say you are teaching a class. I disagree. We are not teaching a class. We are teaching a group of, say, 12 to 20 very different individuals. In a small college, you know every student, right? You are not teaching a class, but you are teaching 20 different individuals. So that's the difference. So interdisciplinary. It's not only multidisciplinary, but really you try to crisscross all the disciplines in your teaching. Intracurricular. Now you call co-curricular is better. I never like the word extracurricular because extracurricular has nothing to do with the curriculum. Then why do you ask the students to do it if it's extra? <laughs> so I never want the word like the word extra. So I coined the word intra, but now you invent the word co-curricular. But co-curricular is still not sufficient. It should be intracurricular. Everything a student does on campus or off campus during one's studying times should be intracurricular, should be integrated, related to the curriculum. Of course, today you have service learning. What well, Polytechnic is doing a lot, doing great in service learning. The service learning is an example of how you integrate service, extra, or extra outside classroom with you know, the inside classroom material, international exposure. And again, I don't like the word, I hear a lot of words conventionally used, like study abroad. We never send students study abroad, right? Because why should we? I think I teach better than other professors. <laughs> Why should I send them abroad? But I still do so. <laughs> because sending them abroad is not for attending classes and taught by different professors, but for the exposure. I use the three E's. I send students abroad for the three E's. There's exposure, experience, and excitement. They need excitement too. So the three E's will be the idea of sending them abroad, you know, for exchange. Now, so, I think these are very important for whole person. Everybody wants to do this five, but you need to have prerequisites. Right? The prerequisites are being fulfilled only by the liberal arts, small size colleges with less than 2,000 students. Okay, a significant life now, turn to a more interesting subject. <laughs> now, as what is a significant life? I try to quote two persons. One is a Harvard professor, right? Uh, he sent him a lecture in 2010. He said, what do you mean by a significant life? Happy, meaningful, worthwhile. But, but he, he, what he said, quite interesting. To see the events of our everyday lives in terms of a greater cultural inheritance that will make us feel connected to our society and invested in our future. So your feel is everything you do in your lifetime. You are connected right, to your surrounding, to history. So that's a meaningful life. You feel happier. You're not alone. You know, you are not, not alone in history. You are not alone in the place. So that's a more meaningful life. Then this is a businessman, uh, Goldman Sachs, right? And then he said, to develop breath, that is in liberal education, in general education, is to be interesting to yourself and other people. That's significant life. If you're always unhappy, then you cannot be. It's not only you are happy. You make people surrounding you happy. So that would be a significant life. But how to achieve all this? How to have a significant life? Now, I think general education plays a key role. Right? In uh, nurturing, you can say, students to have a significant life. Uh, we know today uh, general education is a mandatory part of the core curriculum. 
uh, general education, you are all specialists. Now you all come here, you know much better than I do, and they are interdisciplinary, multidisciplinary, issue-based, problem-based. Um, sometimes <coughs> adopting liberal arts processes, but because of the class size, because of resource limitations, you might not be able to use liberal arts education approaches to teach general education, but that would have been ideal. Now, general education is beyond civility, humanity, and empathy. A lot of people think, a parent especially, go to you, say, I ask my, um, my uh, children to be under you for general education because I want them to be better citizens, right? To be more, you know, civilized, to have no uh, humility, to have empathy. But I don't think that is the ultimate purpose of general education. That should be your parents, should be maybe primary school. I have not really general education to turn someone you know, with a greater civility, humility, and empathy. These are very important, but perhaps not the job of general education. Okay, now, let's look at some of the best practices of general education. Now, there's a Harvard reform, a tremendous reform in 2007. Now, every first year student should take this. I think this would be quite enlightening. Enlightening. Every first year student should take aesthetics, culture, and belief. All these are cross department teachings. Right? It's not only a single department teaching. All these are problem based, issue based, you know, cross preaching, uh, cross Christian, Christian. Now, ethical reasoning, science of living system. These are very, not, not single discipline, but, you know, sounds very interesting. Science of living system, science of the physical universe, society of the world. Last and most important, the United States in the world. So here should be China in the world, Hong Kong in the world. So there should be Hong Kong in the world or China in the world. All right. So every country, when you take general education, you have to have your local, your country, national dimension being built into it. Okay, go back to Asia. Then we all know uh, NUS, Yale. <laughs> it's interesting to see that while liberal arts education is on a decline in the US, used to be 5% of the undergraduates go to liberal arts colleges in the United States. But my information, it has been reduced to about 2.6%. So it's a half. So a 50% cut of students going to liberal arts again because I think presidents of, of liberal arts in colleges not doing a good job. They have not been promoting like me, you know, all the duties of liberal arts education. They thought that's useless. You know, uh, liberal arts you know, graduates will not be able to make a living. Uh, all this are wrong, right? very wrong, very wrong. But, look, but then in Asia, liberal arts education is on the rise. The typical uh, model is a college within a university. So NUS Yale is a, is a typical case of a college within a university. They have the beauty of the support of the whole big university, NUS. At the same time, they have only 500 students. You know, in this leadership, you know, they, tr they, they train leaders, these 500. They don't think they can train leaders, only researchers, maybe specialists at NUS. But when they want to train leaders, they have to rely on NUS A, right, a few hundred students. Now look at the requirement of general education. Again, interesting, I think, right, the way they list their general education courses, right, comparative social inquiry, foundations of science, historical immersion. These are interesting. I, I find them interesting. I'm going to borrow some of this, maybe, <laughs> from some of my institutions. A modern social short, uh, uh, thought, literature, humanity, philosophy, political thought, qualitative reason, scientific inquiry. These are the cross-department, you know, issue-based, you know, it's, it's cross the board kind of program. Zero education is a must for first year and part of the second year programs. Okay, quickly, I have to... Ah, uh, now everybody talks about STEM. I make a difference here. <laughs> everybody thinks Hong Kong's problems without STEM. <laughs> Let me challenge it. Okay? <laughs> Liberal arts education is arts and science. The important is interplay. Don't put too much emphasis just on one stream. STEM, science, technology, engineering, mathematics, is not almighty. What I now, I, now I put it out there because it's copyright. Nobody said it before. Okay? <laughs> this is the first appearance. <laughs> first appearance. <laughs> so you have to uh, cite. <laughs> 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 
Health means history in a narrow sense, or humanities in general. But humanities may be too general. History, ethics, literature, philosophy, health, I think equally important. Next line, very interesting, I've been copyrighted. <laughs> Stand without help is helpless. <laughs> so you need to have stamp and help. Right? Without help, you're not really a perfect whole person. You cannot think properly. You're not creative enough for the fourth industrial revolution. Technology is only second tier. You need someone to instruct the specialists to do things. Right? Inventors. We talk about innovation in Hong Kong. Innovations do not come from hardcore sciences. scientists. Come from there, you know, negative people maybe just what? Taking philosophy. Uh, so you have to see a stamp without help is helpless. <laughs> when you have stamp, a successful career perhaps you have stamp. But life is not necessarily significant. If you want a significant life, please. STEM plus help. <laughs> so example from my own space, I don't want to say too much because of time, but I would say I love history, you know, despite the fact that I'm an economist by training. I tell you how the interplay of uh, arts and uh, science could help even in exams. Now, I took sciences uh, in my lower sex, if you are familiar with the Hong Kong uh, system. We have two A-level years before we take the entrance examination to Hong Kong University. So I took all the sciences, I wanted to become a doctor. But then, during the summer, I read a book in economics by the Nobel laureate called John Hayes. Suddenly, my mind changed. I want to do economics. Then I looked at the entrance requirement to Hong Kong U. If you want to do economics, economics was in the Faculty of Arts. You have to change all your subjects, physics, chemistry, biology, math, to history, Chinese history, geography, and English. So I changed the subject overnight because I want to do economics. There was no choice. So I changed the subject to history, so I ten attended the history exam. So I get only five months or six months to prepare for my four A-level arts subjects. So I did my history. So the first question I chose to answer is the role of Dr. Sanyin Sen in the 1911 revolution. Very straightforward, simple question. Every student could answer it. Right? In Japan, Tong Man Kui, all these societies getting donations, etc. Of course, I knew the same stuff, but my opening sentence was different, I think. I said the role of Dr. Sen in the 1911 revolution was like the role of a nucleus in the chemical process of crystallization. <laughs> <laughs> I say, Dr. Sen said something great. Everything was ready in a crystallization process, but still you need a nucleus for those you know, who are scientists. So the role of Dr. Sen is that nucleus, right, to make crystallization realize. All the rest, I'm sure the same as other students. I thought, of course, the super distinction. <laughs> so, so you know how, if you know science, you know, then ask, there's an interplay. You can become creative. You know, so you answer the question in a totally different approach, in a different way from other students. So I really love history. Another example why I did economics, I specialized in economic growth and development. Because again, I read a very interesting history book. After over 50 years, I could still remember. It's by David Thompson, those who read history. And I asked the other day, the book is still used today, by a Cambridge professor called Europe Since Napoleon. Then I read one particular part of the book, I could still remember after over 50 years, is talking about 1914 to 1948 revolution. During that period, it's a very turbulent period in Europe, but the analysis was in terms of David Thompson, the forces of change versus the forces of continuity. It's wonderfully analyzed. You know, during that period of time, what shaped history? What shaped economic change during those days? Listed the forces of change listed the forces of continuity, the interplay. Just like today, anywhere in the world we face these forces of change and forces of continuity. So as a result of reading that book, I become so much interested in economic change, right? In economic growth and economic development. That became my specialty, my specialism. So history has a lot of impact on me. Philosophy, I'll give you one example. 
I face all kinds of injustice, like you, every day. All right, even recently, my colleagues will support me. A lot of injustice. Now, how would you understand and visualize injustice? Then the way I did it was, I remember Plato. So that's philosophy. And what is the definition of justice? Plato said, justice is the interest of the stronger party. Ah, I understand what <laughs> justice is. <laughs> because I have so many stronger parties <laughs> facing me. Then I know what justice you know, means. So don't you know, think that help no, is no help. Right? Help has a lot of meaning. Making life very meaningful. Making even your, your exam skills you know, better than others. Okay, issues last. I think my, my last bit is the issues you know better than I do. But as an outsider, I look at the issues about you know, general education being implemented in Hong Kong. I think the first thing you have to have the strong support of the senior management. The GE office must be under the president's office, I think. Uh, the, the SMT must take a very active part. Otherwise, without the endorsement of the highest group, then general education will become a kind of lip service. Uh, you have to have a very strong message coming from the very top. I would set up, if I were president, I would set up a GE office under my office right, and pay personal attention to it. This is important. This is just what Linda said about leadership, you know, about the importance of leadership as well. Now, the participation and commitment of faculty, because it's cross-departmental, now, again, there's a huge error, misperception among faculties. I tried to correct when I was a university president. All the most senior, most capable, best professors refuse to teach first year. That's totally forbidden right, in my institution. All the best teachers, most experienced professors should teach first year, should teach general education programs because they are the person who can teach the courses best because they have the experience, they have the expertise. That is the way how Columbia and Chicago are practicing. Right? All the most senior professors must teach and all the fresh PhDs teach a class of five or six very, diffi very difficult, very frontier subjects. I don't know how to teach those frontier subjects. Then ask a fresh PhD to do them. They don't know how to manage a class of 200. They know only how to manage a class of five. So I sent all the fresh PhDs. Right? They're very good right? with uh, you know, very dis distinguished publications. But let's teach five first right? in very difficult subjects. And all the best known, most senior professors teach first year and teach general education. That's not easy. But you have to convince your colleagues. Right? The most experienced, most senior faculty members teach general education courses. I don't know how assessment and examination, this is controversial. Is it different? Should it be the same as the ordinary standard programs? Of course, your other expertise. But I have questions I want to learn from you. You know, how would you assess and exam GE subjects different you know, from the normal subjects? Uh, this is your subject, is the theme of your conference. I could not contribute. But I'm sure the only message is FSTU must have a role to play because you are coordinating all the institutions. Mm -hmm. Whatever we talk about articulation and we talk about transfer, that is the best place. That's the best place. Now, I think, uh, speaking from my own uh, institutions, uh, our community college can communicate very well with Hong Kong U because we are just what? Brothers and sisters. But that's not good enough. Right? Our community college talking to Hong Kong U, you know, when they articulate, that should be a common standard. So we have a common policy, common way. Hong Kong is small, not as complicated as the United States. You know, it's smaller than a state in Hong Kong. And the best place certainly is FST. Um, thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Anderson. Interesting talk, which I feel always happy to learn. Uh, when you talk about STEM, I think that there's another acronym called STEAM to add us into it. Uh, uh, but, but uh, Steve, S T yeah, S T yeah yeah, S T and arts to step. 
Uh, my, my question is not like this. My question is, uh, do, with a liberal asset approach, liberal asset education approach, would you require students of higher caliber? For example, you mentioned about Chicago, the very good liberal school in the US, like Swarthmore and the field. So students like somebody who could switch from science to art in four months. So it is not, because these students are already very adaptable, knowledgeable, and then they can be easily converted to adopt the liberal as a knowledge. Is this an, uh, an important requirement for successful liberal education to apprise students in the liberal arts college in the US? Um, my answer is uh, liberal arts colleges in the United States, as you all know, are very selective. Selective in terms of the good ones are very difficult to get admitted. Uh, maybe uh, two out of ten, or maybe you know even one out of ten is twenty-eight thousand U.S. You know for one child's education It's expensive and selective. But there are different. There are only maybe a couple less than ten percent state-owned liberal arts colleges in the United States. But it's expensive. So natural. But but fortunately. Uh, most liberal arts colleges have very generous scholarships. Say one Pomona. Uh, the actually the return on their endowment, the total return, is good enough to cover all expenses. They don't even have to receive one cent of school fees. So any school fees is a bonus to that college because it's small and it has a huge you know, endowment. Now, I must say, yes, it's highly selective. If you want to go to the first 100 or first 50 liberal arts colleges, they are necessarily you know, smarter students. I mean, that, that, that's true. But smarter, you have to define it differently. Smarter may not mean academically better. Usually, liberal arts colleges will look for students who are all already not in their preparation in their secondary school. So smart, in a sense, not really academic. But you have to you know, be in a sense, you no, know, akin to such a kind of life. Uh, always a discussion, you know, it's always seminars, uh, you have to uh, really uh, live with residential life, all these things. I think it's temperament, personality, that, that, in that sense, but rather than absolute, you no know, straight A's, not necessarily straight A's. But that's why I say basic education is important. Uh, basic education from playgroup. I mean, all your mindset, your mentality, your language skills are all decided in your basic education. Right, so, uh, if you talk about the Hong Kong education system, what you all education specialists to talk more about is how to reform basic education in Hong Kong. You know, more than reforming higher education in Hong Kong. Thank you. Thank you. Is there any questions to Professor Ewe Chen? Just now you mentioned that uh, you talk about very important for basic education. So how do you see uh, what changes should be made for education, uh, I mean in uh, implementing general education in basic education at kindergarten level? So that, so that it's really difficult for us to change them when they come up to the higher education. Well, I'm sure you are all the specialists. Uh, but what I... Uh, I, I think I'm more, for the basic education, I'm less concerned about the curriculum, honestly. I'm more concerned about the processes, right? And no matter what we teach them, I think maybe fine, but it's the you know, processes of teaching in the basic education. So that is some reform. But in Hong Kong, the biggest, I think, problem of our basic education really is, too, is polarized in quality. Right, so that you can't teach really effectively. Uh, polarized in the sense they are really schools are divided into different types. And it's dictated by your financial ability to have access to which type of school. Now I think that is wrong. Right? That is wrong. It's against social justice in Hong Kong. Now uh, primary school or kindergarten, you have international school 
right? You have the subsidized good school, you have the local, you know, school, you have private schools. It seems it's evidently it, it should be true is if you can afford more, you go to better school. This is this is this cannot be right. But this is happening in Hong Kong. When you go to secondary school, it's equally the same. If you have more money, you can go to better schools. Now that that is really a problem, right? Because your financial uh, capability dictates uh, what kind of school you can go. Say direct subsidy school. It's uh, expensive, elitist, good. But then you can look at all these direct subsidy schools. They are all privileged students. Scholarships offered, but nobody will take. Actually, I'm giving a suggestion to proposal to the government. They say every direct subsidy school has a 10% scholarship. But according to a director of audit a few years ago, the take-up rate is less than 1%. You ask why? You offer 10%, supposedly say no discrimination. Right? For most of them, these are Catholic and mostly are Christian schools. Less than 1% take it up. It's a peer pressure. If you're 99%, 95% of them are rich electors, the parents and kids won't want to go to a school surrounded by rich kids, privileged kids, why you are not? So I suggest there must be a critical number you have to inject in the direct subsidy school. Say that number is 30. You have to force a direct subsidy school to accept 30 students under privilege. Then that 30 will become what? A critical mass to have some impact. They won't feel it's being the lesser group. So that, that is something which we have. But then the worst thing is when you go to the high school in Hong Kong, the, the post-secondary education is free for all. Anybody can go to a, 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 some kind of degree program. Uh, not even sub-degree because most of the degree uh, students will naturally get a degree eventually. So this dichotomy, while secondary school is so elitist in a sense, in you know, dividing, but then when you go to post-secondary, everybody has a chance. Whether you're willing or not willing, whether you're capable or not capable, you will still go. You have no money, you get subsidies, you get grants, you get loans. Eventually, you get a degree earning less than 10000 by paying 1500 every month for years to come. So that is, that is wrong to me. It's wrong to me. So, general education really is not the question of curriculum, but the whole system of the Hong Kong education system, and also is the way of teaching young people. So, usually, sometimes it's we have to balance the content and process you know, in teaching and in uh, and in uh, education, I guess. Okay, there's a last student who glad you have a question. <laughs> okay, uh, I don't know if there's time, but I think I may. Thank you very much, Edward. I just believe so much as you do that liberal arts education is the good preparation for the fourth industrial revolution, that the skills that are needed for the inside economy that you refer to are the skills that emerge from liberal, liberal education. So I, I, I appreciate that. Could you speak more as, as you look at this in Hong Kong, the uh, disruption of technology and the impact on jobs the disappearance of some jobs, the emergence of, we think, other jobs. How is, what, what do you see emerging here and what do we as educators need to know about this disruption that's emerging in, in the workforce that we're preparing our students for? I think it goes back to even a higher degree of liberal arts education because if you displace workers, you still need robots. You still need programming. You still need your know, apps. So you displace one kind of job, but you create other kinds of jobs. But this time is more difficult. Unlike the previous industrial revolutions, you, know, you get machine displacing labor. But this time is more massive in displacing. And also the skill you have to be upgraded is so much more difficult. It's not only years of training, but really is intelligence. So I think we all have to work towards that. Understand today there's a huge displacement of workers as a result of technology. But at the same time, some jobs are being created. But these jobs are not necessarily being equally accessed to by all people. So it's up to our, you know, we, you know, as educators, you know, how to really bridge the gap right, in this. New jobs are definitely created, but it's much more difficult than the previous three industrial revolutions. 
know, in, in, in getting these people to the new, you know, jobs. So it's our job. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Everton, for the interesting show. I uh, truly believe that you will remember the ABC the STEM first half. And now, shall we have Ch uh, Professor Chapin Chen and Professor Edward Chen to have a put it together?